spit a lot um, about China's uh, interference and influence operations because generally when we think about China's influence operations, we think of the UFWD, China's United Front Works Department. But um, as far as India is concerned, it's a multi-pronged strategy which comes from China. So um, it's an evolving arena, so it was wonderful uh, listening to you all discuss. Um, we'll go on to the next segment, which is uh, understanding global propaganda uh, threats. Again, extremely interesting. Manufacturing narratives and shaping perceptions. Um, and I'd like to um, invite Abhinav Panda onto the stage for interviewing Clifford Smith. Abhinav and Mr. Clifford Smith, if I could please have you on the stage. First, I'll just uh, briefly introduce uh, Clifford Smith. He's a dear friend, but uh, I'm going to lead on to the work that he has done. Clifford V. Smith is a Middle East Forum's liaison to decision makers and opinion leaders in Washington, D.C. He holds a BA from Washington State University, an MPP with a focus on international relations with Pepperdine University, and a law degree from the Catholic University of America. He is a member of Maryland Bar, an experienced political operator. He is the veteran of numerous campaigns and has held several positions in Congress. Most recently, communications director for U.S. Gary Palmer. His writings have been published in the Daily Caller, The American Spectator, PJ Media, and various other outlets. This is the formal bio, but uh, I would like to mention something that what Cliff has done like, through his writings and through his work, that is something very different and it's more like setting new definitions in the literature or the academic discourse on terrorism and counterterrorism. So far, Normally, we have written, we have heard about terrorist organizations and we study terror financing, terror, terror groups and terrorist organizations. But there is a lot that goes behind them. There are groups which are extremist groups and they operate uh, as uh, legal uh, organizations, completely legal entities, charities. And they do a lot of work which prepares the fundamental base, some kind of an engine to sustain the, the terror groups. So terror groups is something which are just at the surface and they are just you know, something like the pawns or some the uh, infrastructure which goes behind them. That is the real area where we need to focus. And India has been a victim of terrorism in a very, I would say, palpable, obvious manner for the last three decades. Uh, but yes, you know, even before that, uh, we've had issues with religious extremism, fundamentalism and terrorism. So here I would like to ask you know a few things which he uh, has done, especially on these organizations. And he specializes in the uh, Jamaat-e Islami's lobbies in the US. And Jamaat-e Islami is one of the most uh, dreaded terrorist group in Jammu and Kashmir. I've worked on that group, you know, and uh, I can say that behind that 2016 post Burhan Wani and counter agitation, entire Kashmir was in flames, and Jamaat-e Islami as an organization was behind that entire agitation. A large number of majority, I would say, overwhelming majority of the militants, uh, they have a background in Jamaat Islam. And they have a very different modus operandi that they would uh, go to Jamaat and then uh, after the training, they would just uh, leave the organization. And after that, after a while, they would join this, uh, uh, join a terror group. So Jamaat has always carried a very different perception that they are into education, they are into charity. But that was one another outlet. They, uh, in the 1990s, the militants buried all the schools. After that, Jamaat opened its schools. They created a generation who were completely radicalized. You know, and uh, they were the people who joined the administration, joined the police, joined the intelligence in the state, the academia. At the same time, they were the people supplying cadres to the terrorist groups. So it created an ecosystem which was self-sustaining, which was symbiotic, and which was helping each other. And off late, Jamaat has uh, created many lobbies in the U.S. And they are different charity groups. So regarding that, Cliff is the best man to tell us about that. So Cliff, over to you. Well, uh, I owe a lot to one of my colleagues, Sam Westrop, who, uh, frankly, I would say is the true expert on some of this. He uh, spent years exposing this in the UK and then moved to the US to do some of the same stuff. And um, people that pay attention to Islamism, um, which we view as you know, a theocratic interpretation of Islam tended in the U.S. to focus on uh, Middle East focus groups, and I'm from the East Forum, and so did we. 
Sam was the first one that really noticed that, at least in the U.S., there were Islamist groups, radical Muslim groups, that were primarily from South Asia that were doing similar things, and almost nobody was talking about it. Um, and that is when we got involved in sort of this issue. Um, for example, um, there's a group um, called um, Islamic Circle of North America. Everybody knows what that is. It sounds innocuous. It sounds boring. Um, but even according to academics, I don't necessarily see the world as I do on the political spectrum. Somebody like Wally Nasser at uh, Johns Hopkins University says, Ikna is simply the Western branch of jamaat e islami And he, he talks about this openly. It is not a secret. Anybody who looks at this for two seconds realizes it. Um, multiple people from um, Pakistani jamaat e islami Bangladeshi jamaat e islami were in the leadership of this organization. And... Um, they formed an organization that has been going for many years. Nobody really paid attention to what they did. Um, and they formed sub-organizations. They have ICNA Relief, which does charitable work domestically. They have Helping Hands for Relief and Development, um, a charitable group that does work um, in South Asia, among other places. And what does this mean? Well, um, there's a picture I was actually going to ask if somebody could put up here. Um, this is a billboard in Michigan, middle of the United States. Um, what does it say? Free Kashmir, Stop Genocide, Oppression, and Fascism. Paid for by Ignis Council for Social Justice and Stand with Kashmir. Now, this is the kind of message that Ignis is putting up right around 2019. Um, this is the way they look at the world. And who is Stand with Kashmir? We'll get to that in a second. But, they are preaching a message that there is genocide going on in Kashmir, oppression, fascism. This is what they tell the people. And I, I'm going to say something that I really don't mean, I hope you understand is funny, uh, but to most Americans, even well-meaning Americans, you say the word Kashmir, they think of sweaters or a Led Zeppelin song. Um, they don't think much about it at all. So when someone comes to them and says, oh my god, genocide in Kashmir, oh no, that's terrible. They don't know enough to even ask the next question. And so these kinds of narratives have a big uh, impact. What we noticed was that on top of just promoting political propaganda, they were doing things like, um, they have a charity, as I mentioned, HHRD, Helping Hands for Leading Development. It is their self-declared sister organization. The guy that is currently the president of ICNA used to be president of HHRD and openly refers to HHRD as their charitable arm. I mean, this is not an ambiguous, complicated thing. Everybody knows what's going on. HHRD was holding conferences in Pakistan with Lashkar Teva and you know, legitimizing them as an American organization. They were, um, and probably still are, uh, giving lots of money to um, the Al-Kidmat Foundation. Al-Kidmat is Jamaat charity in Pakistan. Um, they have done many other church projects in that region of a similar nature. Um, both groups that are overtly terrorist groups, even according to the U.S., um, and groups that themselves work closely with these kinds of groups as well. So what you have is you have multiple problems. You have the radicalization of American Muslims. You have um, the funding of these groups through charitable processes that radicalize both Americans and Pakistanis and Kashmiris, Bangladeshis as well, for what it's worth. Um, and you also have um, the sort of propaganda they put out. Um, for example, um, Stand with Kashmir. Who is Stand with Kashmir? I don't know, um, is the bottom line. They are an organization that was set up in 2019 when um, right around the time 370 was abrogated, and they're very shadowy. They got a bunch of money from somewhere, not quite sure where. They, um, what we do know is that um, one of their um, head honchos is married to a guy named Azad Issa. Azad Issa is a journalist based out of New York. He is of Indian origin, apparently. I believe he was, I'm not sure where he was born. Um, he works for the Middle East Eye. The Middle East Eye is a Qatari propaganda outfit. And he wrote an op-ed, for example, um, Excuse me if I'm getting a little bit carried away. I hope everybody's following me. There's so many parts to what's going on. Um, he wrote an op-ed in February of 2019, right after the Palama terrorist attack, 
saying that um, basically Israel and India were dual oppressors and Gaza and Kashmir are the same place. Um, particularly bold thing to do after a terrorist attack that killed 40 people. Um, but that is the narrative that they've been spinning ever since. Um, which leads me to another point, and that is that when you have groups like Ikhma, a Jamadi group, come and start preaching narratives, they're not doing it alone. There are other groups, um, also with foreign ties, also that are radical, um, that have ties to the Middle East, Muslim Brotherhood, um, some of the Turkish groups, some of um, you know, Salafi types, what have you, some of the more <coughs> radical interpretations of Islam in the Middle East have organizations too, the most famous of which is CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. Um, CARE's executive director joined ICNA to protest in front of the Indian Embassy um, in, in, I believe it was 2020, uh, maybe late 2019, I can't remember exactly the date. Um, that's just one example. Um, Students for Justice in Palestine, pretty specific big group name, also part of the protest. Um, there was the BDS movement, a movement entirely um, created to um, single out Israel um, and um, freeze funds going to it for the sake of the Palestinian cause, also were joining in anti-Indian anti um, disputes based on the Kashmir issue. So what I'm getting at is, is that um, when you're dealing with an issue like Kashmir, you're already starting with a built-in opposition that from my um, point of view anyway, very few Indians, um, and certainly and even Indian Americans that are trying to make the case for their ancestral homeland are aware of, and they're not organized in the same way. So when they come with the narrative of you know, genocide, of uh, fascism, it's not that necessarily everybody believes them, but they have a narrative to start out with that is the only thing being preached in some situations. Um, there was a hearing at the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Kashmir in late 2019. And it was very interesting because a Kashmiri pandit named Arti Tiku Singh, some people around here might know her, was there testifying about her experiences and her family's experiences. And she was instantly hit with um, even by congressmen that you previously might have thought would have been more sympathetic with you know, these kinds of charges. Um, the Stand with Kashmir group had put out an op-ed the day before the hearing blasting her, and shockingly, not really, a bunch of congressmen were using talking points that appeared to be right out of that op-ed. Um, and nobody saw it coming. Um, they could have, frankly, in retrospect. At the time, nobody quite knew what was happening. But, um, that was where things started out because they had already laid the groundwork and there was not much pushback. She was kind of a lone pushback. And um, to just show you how difficult it was, Ilhan Omar, who is one of the more, um, uh, she's a complicated figure. I'm sure, I don't know if many people know who she is. She's a congresswoman that is originally from Somalia and she frequently, I, I personally, my personal belief about her is that she is more far left than she is an Islamist, but she preaches Islamist causes. And she actually got a waiver to appear in the subcommittee specifically to go after RTT Singh. And she was not part of the subcommittee normally, but she got a waiver and she basically was doing the same kind of thing. What was she known for before then? She was known for going after Israel. And to the best of my knowledge, the best anybody can tell in public, she had zero background in South Asia or India or any of these issues at all. Again. There's a built-in network already ready to go after India on these issues. And so when India is dealing with these kinds of issues in D.C., you need to be cognizant of what you're up against. So, so Cliff, yes. Uh, one more question. I'm just going to combine all the questions because I guess we are running behind the sheets. Normally, like, we saw that in the recent past, you know, some of these groups, uh, they do a lot of lobbying with the U.S. CIRF and you know, all, mm -hmm. in this matter of yeah, CA and RC. They were very active in creating a very fabricated narrative against mm -hmm. India. And some of their meetings are attended by uh, Pakistan-sponsored lobbies like mm -hmm. Mr. Fai and all. And even in the American the universities and campuses, you know, I, mean, I, I studied in Cornell, so I can tell you. Mm -hmm. I felt that, you know, that uh, they hold, they have a massive influence over there. 
So I, I mean, what exactly, I mean, in your opinion, uh, what are the uh, what is, uh, tactics and uh, how this can be countered? I want to be able, I want to be try to be as specific as I can on this. Uh, the, the U.S. Mission on International Religious Freedom. Um, yes, there's no doubt that the, a group, you know, the Indian American Muslim Council, which um, has worked with ICNA, which clearly has some links to Jamaati Islami. There's no doubt that they were trying to shape the narrative for the commission. Um, I think that's clear. Um, I think that the lack of a effective counter narrative and a counter information to that was problematic. Um, I wouldn't. I, I do think that there are issues that are going to Americans and Indians are going to see somewhat differently. I'm not sure the problem would have just vanished and they not existed. I think there would have been issues that um, the way Americans view some of the issues of religious liberty and the way Indians do are not necessarily 100% the same. So I think it's a mistake to attribute it entirely to them. Um, I do think, though, that, again, the problem is there needs to be a more aggressive effort to present a different point of view from the outset. Because I would argue not only do groups like ICNA not represent Ameri you know, Indian Hindus or their point of view or Kashmiri, um, you know, they don't, um, they don't represent the views of Indian or American Muslims either, on That's a large right. part. And unless there is a very effective counter um, narrative, um, that's going to run the table just because it's the only thing people know. And I think being out front about um, you know, what your views are pays a lot of dividends. Having something out there explaining what you are for and what you are, um, are trying to do rather than being reactive is important because um, you know, it's, it's an old uh, expression in American politics. Um, you know, if you're explaining, you're losing. Um, that's sort of the problem. And all of the, to the best of my knowledge, almost all of it's been, at least from the organized diaspora, organized groups. Not that they've done a bad job of what they've done, but the vast majority of it has been reactive. Which, to a certain degree, is some of the work I've done in Congress is to try to do the opposite thing. Um, for example, um, we can look it up online. A couple of months ago, there was a letter um, from Congressman McCall, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, which was asking, essentially, was berating USA, USAID for giving money to the Jamadi charity I mentioned, um, and saying, basically, why did you do this, and why didn't you look into it more, and all this kind of stuff. Um, that's a battle still ongoing, by the way, long story there. But the point is, putting the focus back on them and saying, hey, wait a sec, you know, here's who you are, you know, one of your financers, you know, got convicted of lying to the FBI as part of a terror finance investigation. You know, who are you to be telling stories? That's something that's necessary, and I think there needs to be more um, starting out saying, okay, look, number one, we are doing what we are doing in Kashmir or whatever other issue that he is working on because of X, Y, and Z. This is our values. This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is why we're doing it. Um, and also, I think that. Um, showing who your opponents are, or truly, um, is also very important to shaping the narrative. Thank you very much, Cliff. You know, I guess you know we would uh, love to hear more from you because this is something very unique and something very enlightening. This adds a completely new dimension to the entire discourse and literature on terrorism and radicalization. But you know, I mean, we are running short of time and we have other uh, sessions scheduled. So uh, I'll just uh, please uh, pardon me. Thank you, sir.